we are now going to tell the story of an allowance that I, an opportunity I had when I was younger. But before that, I want you to know that it can be, I think, successfully argued that this is the single most important video that this course will present to you this year. So I hope you're really locked in on it, that you pay attention, and let's see what we've got going on here. When I was a kid, like most parent, like most kids, I bugged my parents for allowance, and if they would even give it to me for a raise in allowance, and my parents would always tell me how I wasn't responsible enough and I didn't deserve it. So, so one day I was arguing with my dad for an allowance, and I wanted, I think I wanted five dollars a week. Um, I was, in, I was like, I don't know, a sophomore in high school, and I'm going, Dad, Dad, come on, I need five bucks a week. That's not too much. Five bucks a week. You know, I'm getting old enough now. I can take a girl on a date. I can do things. And I want to earn the money. So I'll do some work around the house. Go five bucks a week. And my dad said, ah, no, no, no. I said, I'll tell you what. I'll put, I'll give you your choice. I'll give you five bucks a week. Or I'll put a penny on your dresser, two pennies. And I will double the amount of pennies on your dresser every single day for a month. And you can have whichever you want for your allowance. And I said, oh, I'll take the five bucks. I was like, oh, this is great. I'll take the five bucks. And my dad started laughing, saying it would be worth over a million dollars at the end of the month if I would have taken the pennies. And I said, no way. Well, let's see what happens. These are the days of the months from day one to day 31. This is the amount of pennies on the dresser. Remember, my dad started with two cents. So in three days, I have eight cents on the dresser. At this point, it's looking like I made a very wise decision to keep my five bucks. On day six, I have 64 cents on the dresser. I'm just doubling it every day. You can see that by the chart. And you're saying, oh, man, no wonder you, no wonder this guy's a math teacher. He had this whole thing figured out. What about by day 10? Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> by day 10, it's up to 10 bucks. It's a little over 10 bucks. Uh, maybe he spoke too soon. Well, that's okay because... 10 bucks, 10 days, day 10 is almost two weeks. That's like five and five is 10. But day 11, oh, I copied over day 11 at $10.24. That shouldn't be. I should have done it even more there. Okay, so this means it actually works out to be higher. But the point behind this will be the same. Um, doubling it every single day by day 20, and in reality it's more, is $5,242.88. And at the end of 31 days, it's $5 million, over $5 million. So I think my dad pulled one over on me. And I can only imagine the amount of work I'd have to do to get a $5 million allowance. And my dad is not Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos. So how can this be? How could it be worth this amount of money? Well, that is the miracle or, or the curse of compound interest. Here's your compound interest formula on the side. And what I want you to notice is that this is exponential because the variable, the number of years, is in the numerator. Okay? So I want to show you how you can be rich. And I mean this. This is a guaranteed way to be rich, assuming that you work pretty hard. All right? You don't have to kill yourself as long as you work pretty hard and you're smart enough to put money away in a really good fund. I use the fund called the Investment Company of America. And they averaged about 12% a year for almost 100 years. They never had a five-year losing period. In some years, it would be more than 12%, some years less, but it averaged about 12%. So I'm, it's beyond the scope of this course right now to teach you how to work with this formula. But following this formula, and considering that I do this for a living, um, you can count on my calculations. In one year, you would have... Oh, first I did year five, just to give you an idea. This is how you use the calculation. The $3,000 you start with, one plus the interest rate over 100, raised to the fifth power for five years. And it's worth $5,287.02. That's how much money would be in the account. But let's go back and see how much would be at the end of year one. $3,360. At the end of three years, $4,214. The end of five years. 52.87, the end of 10 years, 93.17.54. 15 years, $16,000. And, you know, 3,000 has turned into 16,000. That's pretty good. But look what happens. Normally speaking, what I'm talking about is having you put this money in at about 20 years of age. 
and take it out when you're 45 years old, ready to retire. So, or when you're 65 years old. So that means it sits in there for 45 years. At 25 years, you're up to 51 grand. And at 45 years, you're up to half a million dollars. So do you see how it slowly grows in the beginning? But then it gets a point where, kind of like where it turns on that exponent graph, and it starts shooting up really, really, really fast. And that is the magic or curse of compound interest. Magic if you're putting the money away. Now, I want you to notice something. You're going to have a cool half a million if you put the $3,000 away at age 20 and you don't put any more money in the bank. Just leave it there. $3,000 turns into half a million dollars in 45 years. Imagine if for the rest of your life you put away just 10% of what you saved and you put it in the bank and we used compound interest on that. Now, I don't have to imagine that because I have a grandfather named, oh, we call him Papa. He was exactly like Clint Eastwood in the movie Gran Torino, if you ever saw it. Hard-nosed, depression survivor, tough man. Papa quit high school during the Great Depression because Papa's own father, my great-grandfather, broke his back. And they needed someone to work so that they wouldn't lose the house. And my grandfather made it a rule to put 10% of every check away for the rest of his life. My grandfather was a custodian who did part-time work as a truck driver, a mechanic, and a carpenter. Um, he did not have his high school diploma until he, he, when he was in his 50s, his later 50s. And I actually tutored him. How weird is that? Um, he got his high school equivalency diploma. But what my grandfather was, was brilliant at managing money. And 10% of every paycheck, he did not make much money. 10% of every check went into the bank his entire working career. And he retired, he, he died a millionaire all because of how he was able to manage his money. And that's what I'm suggesting to you. If you manage your money like Papa managed his money, you will retire with a whole lot of money in the bank. And then what's really cool about it, and you talk about generational wealth, and some people talk about the, the really rich people in the world. Well, the reason is really simple, because they made the money. And then once you get to a certain point, like how this money escalated to half a million, the money is making money for you. You don't even have to go to work to make money. The money makes money. And then you leave it to your children. And your children don't start with $3,000 in the bank at age 20. They start with $3 million in the bank at age 20. And they get super, super, super rich. Now, I also want you to understand that being rich is not the key to life. And I, I don't think being rich is, is the key to life. Um, for me, charity is really important and I give money away every single month. But I do think it is important to not have to work, work, work every minute of every day for your entire life. And that if you can afford a life for your family where you gain purpose in work, that you try to make the world a better place and you have enough money set aside that you don't have to worry about money, then you can live life in a really full and complete manner. Okay. Um, one last thing I want you to notice about this money and its growth is that it depends on two things. It depends on how much money you put in and how long you leave it there. The longer you leave it there and you have the discipline to not touch it, the better off you're going to be. So this is how you get rich. You put some money in the bank and you leave it alone. Now, I think most of you guys are not even yet 20 years old. So do you think you can possibly earn $3,000 between now and your 20th birthday? And that you could invest this money in a fund like the Investment Company of America. I'm not a professional financial advisor. You find your own people to, to tell you where to put the money. Make sure they're trustworthy and wise. And that the whatever account you use has a long history of success. Put it in there and you will see what's happening. Let's say that you put $7,500 in the same fund at age 21. And you let it sit there until age 65. How much money do you think it'd be worth? Over a million, 1.1 million. Now, these numbers are assuming you put it in once at age 20 or 21 and leave it alone. Now imagine if you follow my grandfather's principle of 10% every check. Oh my Lord, you would have an enormous amount of money. And then imagine how much good you can do in the world with that money. I, I don't want, well, it's, it's up to you to do what you want with your money, but I don't think it's a good thing to go out and make money to just heap your blessings upon yourself. I think it's really important to make the money and to make and to use it to make everybody's lives better.
but you determine how you want to spend your money to make people's lives better. I think that's the way to go about doing it. I don't like being told where I have to put my money or have someone take my money from me and then use it in certain places. You would be very, very, very successful and you'd set your family up for centuries to come. Okay. All right. Now, I said it could be the curse. Uh, it could be the, the, the great benefit, the magic, or it could be the curse. I don't know if you know it or not, but a mortgage works on an exponential principle as well. Uh, so credit cards. Okay. Let's just look at a mortgage, for instance, here. And this is what we call an amortization table. And it's a printout of what's going on with this exponential mortgage function. This is an interest rate of 6%, which is probably a little higher than it is right now. Um, my personal interest rate on my mortgage is 3%. Um, but when I first bought a house, they were up around 12%. So the interest rate can vary depending on the economy at the time. Um, right now, we're going through what you call a little bit of an inflationary stage. So it tends to bring the interest rates up on mortgages. So here's the year, year 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. When you first start making payments on this mortgage, you're going to pay $1,356.40 a month. Of that, only $225 goes to principal. The rest goes to interest. Now it's eight years later. You've been paying your mortgage on time. You got it all done. You're still paying the same amount every month, $1,356.40. Now you're paying only about 1000 in interest every month. And you're paying a whopping $361 in, in principal. So what this means is every single month as you're making your payments, you're not, it's not like the whole $1,356 is going to the amount that you borrowed from the bank. Only in the beginning, 225 bucks. In year eight, only 361 bucks. The rest is all interest that the bank takes. Do you ever ask yourself how the banks can put all these commercials on radio and TV, where all this money comes from? Well, think about it. People go out, they buy a house, they take out a mortgage, and Almost all of that mortgage payment, about 80% of it, even a little bit more, is all about interest. So the bank's making all that money back. It goes to the bank. It doesn't go to you. Now here's the year eight. Now you go to year 19. Now you're paying still, it's only $700 out of that $1,356. And go to year 25. Now you're talking. Now you're getting up to a thousand per. And then at the end, the whole payment virtually is interest, or is principal. Principal is the amount you borrowed. So if you look again, see how slowly it goes up in the beginning? Slow, 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 just like the graph. Slow, slow, slow. Now it starts booking. Now it starts going really, really fast. So what does this mean? It means that when you take out a mortgage, every time you take a mortgage, you go back to the beginning where you're paying very little principal and lots of interest. So the value of the house, you're not getting much on the house. Now, how did this affect me? First off, this is a 30-year amortization plan. I took a 15-year plan. Look at what the last 15 years look like. The last 15 years are much nicer to the home buyer. So if you can ever afford a 15-year mortgage, do it for sure. It's a lot more work in the beginning. It's more expensive for a 15-year mortgage, but more of the money is going to principal, which means you will own your house sooner. It was really important in our case because I wanted to retire and I didn't want, I wanted to have the most equity possible. And when we sold our house, our house sold for $360,000 and I only owed like 95,000 on the house. So that gave me a cool $265,000 in cash that I could put down on the house we ended up building. Now, the scary thing is the credit cards work the same exact way. So if you made, this is a very big credit card payment, but if you made a $1,356 credit card payment, only 225 bucks comes off what you owe the credit card. So if you owed $10,000 to a credit card and you made that payment, only $225 goes to the principal, which means the next month you still practically owe $10,000. You owe $9,875. Or $9,775. That's a crazy thing. And that's why putting money on a credit card is so dangerous because you never pay off the bill. And what's really freaky and scary about the credit card is every time that you charge with the card, 
the process starts all over again. It's as if you're taking out a new loan each month. Okay? Don't get credit cards. I know, look, I have a credit card. I put bills on it every month and I pay the thing off at the end of every month so I don't pay any interest. Um, most people can't do that. So you got to be really, really careful. I learned a long time ago, the number one reason for divorce in the world is money. It's not cheating on your spouse. It's money. It's fights over money. The number one reason for stress in people's lives, you got relationships and you've got money. Money, Money's not good. Money's not bad. It's a tool. And how you manage money has a lot to do with how you're able to live your life. If you pursue money because you want to be rich and that's your whole end to the mean, mean to the ends, well, you know what? That's the lust of money and that's a very dangerous thing. It can be the root of all evil. But if all you do is make sure that you manage your money well, that you never need to put up with this again, then that's a really good thing. So realize the power of compound interest. It can work for you or it can work against you. And it's all an exponential formula. Okay, the recap for our work today. Holding a finger up in the air. Draw a linear graph. Boom, hope you drew a straight line. Draw a quadratic graph. Hope you drew a U. Draw an exponential graph. Hope you drew kind of flat, 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 and then it takes off and goes really high. <clears throat> um, what is the exponent on a linear function with the X? It's a one. What about a quadratic? It's a two. What about an exponential? Well, that's where the variable is. It's an X or N for a number of years. What are the two most important lessons you learned in class today? I think the most important lessons you learned are be really, really careful with a credit card. <laughs> it's so dangerous. And the second thing is um, if you manage your money wisely, if you put some away like the $3,000, there will be a day in the future where you really, really, really appreciate it not touching that $3,000. All right, the power of compound interest, which is an exponential function. Hope you guys understand all about that. See a financial advisor. He'll explain it even more to you.